Hello everyone, I'm Brian, welcome back, and let's go ahead and continue. Study. Okay, let me take a few more online questions. Uh, how about here? In one of your videos, this is a question from Arju. Arju, does it say where he lives? No. Arju, perhaps in India. So Arju writes, in one of your videos, you mentioned how uh, Puja Swami Dayananda, my guru, once struggled with getting into samadhi. And he got, he got so frustrated, he gave away all his books. And then he met Swami Pranavananda. This is largely correct. And he realized that he, need, he received from Pranavananda a key to understanding the scriptures. And that key was understanding that the scriptures are an independent means of knowledge called pramana. After understanding, and now his question, after understanding this, was he able to identify the key? Obviously. Uh, oh, that's not the question. And after understanding this, he was able to identify the key, that Vedanta is a means of knowledge. I'll talk more about that. But now the question is, was he able to get into samadhi after that? And what is the state of samadhi? So Arju has, has made this really common confusion between samadhi and enlightenment. These oh. are absolutely separate things. Samadhi is an experience. And actually in, in Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, he gives a whole array, different kinds of samadhi. At least, I think, nine different kinds of samadhi are identified in those Yoga Sutras. I thought it was the same, just a, again, another word for enlightenment, <clears throat> or perhaps in a state of enlightenment, perhaps. Uh, I made that assumption. I, I know I've heard Samadhi said many times before, or maybe not many times, but enough, perhaps. <laughs> I don't remember how many. I know I've heard of it, but perhaps I don't really have a good definition of it. I perhaps should be looking up some videos about what is Samadhi and um and clearly apparently there's nine different ones so what what is samadhi first and foremost and then perhaps delve a little bit in terms of the nine at least the nine different ones and samadhi is a condition of your mind this is a f f oh, you, some of you have heard this before but it is so fundamental appreciate its importance Samadhi is a state of mind, correct? Is it possible to have a permanent state of mind? Maybe. The only example I can think of is coma. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe coma can be a permanent state of mind. <coughs> but <laughs> other than that, our experience is mind changes constantly, full stop. If one gains samadhi, you enjoy it. Wait, what about sleeping, deep sleep? Uh, maybe not deep sleep. Deep sleep, you tend to go into dreams, which in your mind perhaps does go in a change of mind. <clears throat> like regular sleep, I guess, not deep sleep, not REM sleep. Unless it's blank, <laughs> then REM sleep. But REM sleep tends to be the part when you actually start having dreams. Any other port, part of of, uh, of sleeping that's not REM, I believe, is not quite sleeping per se. It's like a like getting into it or out of of uh, deep sleep. I believe again, you know, don't quote me on that. But uh, maybe that, you know, at the one portion of the sleep. Then it comes to an end. By the way, Patanjali in his Yoga Sutra is not dumb. He recognized this problem and goes through extraordinary <laughs> lengths to come up with a complex explanation for how samadhi can actually result in a permanent state of freedom. 
this is it's very complex and is very non Vedantic, highly involved with the laws of karma. Anyway, I, it's not, at least in my my opinion, it's not very helpful. So we'll set that aside. So if we understand samadhi as a transient state of the mind, that certainly cannot be enlightened. You can't go into samadhi and then emerge and say, yes, I was enlightened for 10 minutes. That's silly. So enlightenment is not samadhi. Enlightenment is completely dissimilar, uncoupled from samadhi. Here's something you'll be surprised to know. You can become enlightened without ever experiencing samadhi. I'm not making this up. <laughs> This is Sri Shankaracharya's teachings. There's no necessity. There might be a necessity to prepare your mind through meditation, but to achieve, everyone talks about nirvikalpa samadhi. Suppose you don't attain nirvikalpa samadhi. No problem. <laughs> Just meditate. Meditation will prepare your mind for Vedanta to lead you to discover what you want to discover. And this is, this is, a, this is a part that um, Arju refers to, which is correct. And that is, uh, not that my guru was striving for samadhi, he was striving for enlightenment, not samadhi. And he wasn't getting it. He was, he was studying more and more and more scriptures and nothing was happening. Then, as, as, uh, as Arju says, it's a true story. My, my guru, by the way, he had already devoted, I think, 15 years of his life. He was a brahmachari, living a, a full-time, life of a full-time spiritual seeker. And at one point, he got so frustrated, he was going to give it all up. And he actually gave away his books. And he says, I've got to try something else. And then, fortunately, someone advised him to meet this teacher in Andhra Pradesh. He was in, in Tamil Nadu then. So he goes to Andhra, and he meets the Swami uh, Pranavananda, and he gets what, what he considers to be like the missing key that unlocks the scriptures. And the missing key is your approach to the scriptures. And this brings us to a topic we've talked about many, many times. And that is, the scripture is not a collection of spiritual ideas, wisdom, concepts. It's by studying the scriptures, yeah. You, you've heard me say this before. If all you're doing is, stu is studying the scriptures, you're wasting your time because the subject matter that counts is not the scriptures, but you, your true nature, and removing the ignorance which seems to prevent you from understanding your true nature. So here's, here, the key is this. The key, as, as Arju correctly said, the key is l understanding that Vedanta is a pramana. Uh, what is a pramana is complicated. I don't, if we get started with that, it'll be an hour, honestly. So let, let's find, uh, there's a metaphor that might be much more easy to comprehend. Suppose you have a map and you start learning all the information on the map. The names of all the cities, populations, where they're located, what are the roads that connect them, what are, where are the airports, what, you know, you can learn all this stuff from a map. Yeah. What is the purpose of a map? The purpose of a map is to lead you to a destination. If you use the map only for the sake of extracting information, you are not using the map correctly. The map is intended to lead you to a destination. If you use the map correctly, 
you can reach a destination. It's very powerful when it's properly used. I'll say this. <clears throat> a map is not necessarily not necessarily just for directions, because people love looking at map and just gathering your information and just look at it in general. But he is trying to make a very specific point about the map. I, I, the reason why I wanted to say this is because there could be some people who think like me and say, well, no, I like looking at maps and just looking at places. You know, so what's over here? What's over there? There are weird people out there who loves maps and just loves the information in general. But I get what he's trying to say. It's essentially that <clears throat> if you look at scriptures just to get information, then you're not going to get to your destination. <laughs> But it, it, the and that's the thing. I was like, I was thinking along the lines like, you know, you use scripture like the way I do it. I I do look at stuff to get information, so I know how to get to my destination. Because when you look at a map, it just tells you to go from here to here, but not necessarily how to get there. Like, um, like you can see many roads, and you in. You say, oh, I'll take this road, and you go there, and all of a sudden you realize it's an uphill climb, and you're like, my vehicle can't climb that, so that's not the right road for me. I have to, I have to go back again. Let me look at the map. Let's try this road. You go to that one, you realize, oh, that's a hiking trail. I can't take my car up that. It's not, my, it's not big enough for me to take my car, so I have to go back. Let's look at the map again and take the other road. So you're hoping that when you look at the map or the information in the text that it explains to you this road is for cars this road is for people who are crazy and want to take the wild ride <laughs> but you get my point like it explains how to arrive at the destination with the with what equipment that you have i suppose but then again maybe 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 the map uh, from what his perspective is is that it'll tell you the many different roads but you need a guru to say, this is your road. This is the road that's best suited for you. Not this road, not that, uh, yeah, not this road, not that road, but this one. This is your road based on whatever it may be. And when you're merely gaining information from the uh, map, you don't go anywhere. So this is what it means to understand Vedanta as a pramana. Vedanta is not a compilation of scriptural wisdom. Vedanta is like a map insofar as it is meant to guide you on a journey, but the journey is not outside on the road. This journey is an inward turned journey. So, like a map guides you on the roadways, the teachings of Vedanta are intended to guide you on a process of self-inquiry, Atma Vichara. So that's, that's the so-called key. And uh, it was transformative in my guru's life. If he failed to discover that, hmm, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> because he wouldn't be who he was and I, you know, the only reason I can teach is because of, of his wonderful tr uh, teachings. So this is the key. The complex way of saying it is Vedanta is an independent means of knowledge, a pramana. That's a very technical expression. Very simple way to understand it is Vedanta is not a compilation of s scriptural wisdom. It is, however, a method intended to guide you on a process of self-inquiry. That's, that's uh, a good way of understanding. Okay, before it moves on to that, we can kind of go back to what he explained about the story of his guru, where he had, I'm assuming the books he gave away are all about Advaita Vedanta, and <clears throat> these are apparently the maps that he's talking about. But like I said about my explanations, the sheer fact that you can look at all the maps and there are f infinite, well, <laughs> I don't know if infinite is the right word, but perhaps an infinite number of ways to get to enlightenment. But those infinite number of ways are not always right for the individual. There is a few, uh, a few number of paths that is right for the individual and there's a 
near infinite number of ways of going wrong. So while the map, the the uh, the, the textbooks may be a map. Again, I could be completely wrong on this, but if it makes sense to you, that's great. Let me know. <laughs> or if it doesn't, if I'm wrong, let me know. <laughs> but the textbooks are the maps of infinite ways to get to enlightenment. But you may need a guru, which like his guru so happens to need, to find the correct path for you. And which, in his guru's way, in fact did. The key, uh, you could say, translates to the correct path for him to get enlightenment. He read every single book was a genuine direct path to enlightenment but for his guru it was not the right path until his guru I believe met his guru <laughs> um, and then found the key or quote unquote the right path to enlightenment perhaps take a couple more questions here Okay, this is from uh, Jeevan Kumar, who lives in West Bengal. Um, question, if knowledge can only, if, if only, I'm going to have to uh, make this clear. Um, Shankara teaches jnanameva mokshaha, that knowledge alone leads to enlightenment. And knowledge, not any kind of knowledge, but specifically knowledge of your true nature. Knowledge of Satchirananda Atma being the same as Satyam Jnanam Anantam Brahma, to use the words of our scriptures. So it says, um, if, if knowledge alone can, can bring self-realization, enlightenment, then how can those practicing other traditions like yoga, meditation, and bhakti, how can they gain enlightenment? And he refers to his, his wife performing uh, kundalini yoga and meditating, m meditating a lot. Okay, um, we've had this discussion before. Let me, let's um, understand. Jnana meva moksha. If the problem, <laughs> the solution has to fit the problem, right? What is, what is the problem? You are, al your true nature is already satchitananda atma. To, or to use simple terms, your true nature is already divine. That inner divinity is already the essence of who you are. So you don't become it, you are it. So you realized. already are. And that's so obvious from Mahavakyas, like Tatvamasi. It says you are that. It doesn't use a future tense verb. It doesn't say you will become that. You already are that which you want to be. You already have that which you want to possess. These are my Guru's words, very lovely. So then, jnanameva moksha, if the problem is, my Guru had a nice word for it, he called it self-non-recognition. Failure to recognize your true inner nature as such a dananda atma, failure to recognize that inner divinity. So if the problem is self non-recognition, will meditation remove that particular kind of ignorance? Now this is interesting. If you're meditating, your meditation is based on the knowledge you currently have. Or more sarcastically, your meditation is based on the ignorance <laughs> you already have. So if you are not yet enlightened and you're meditating, don't you think that your ignorance will affect your meditation? You're not yet enlightened. So meditation in and of itself cannot 
reveal your true nature as Satchirananda Atma. Bhakti, devotion on itself cannot reveal your true nature as Satchirananda Atma. But on the other hand, and it's important to put this in right now, without meditation and without devotion, without karma yoga and without a whole lot of other spiritual practices, you'll find that the knowledge Shankara is referring to will escape your grasp. That's the relationship. Knowledge removes ignorance and leads to enlightenment, but how to gain that knowledge? That knowledge will be inaccessible unless you practice meditation, bhakti, karma yoga, and other, other practices. Okay. Real quick about the, the map again. <clears throat> Just thinking about it a little bit as I was watch, uh, listening to him explain that. So I want to say this. It's not to say that you absolutely need a guru to find your path. Obviously, many people who have meditated have found their path. However, you increase, I believe you increase your likelihood with a guru. Um, <clears throat> and I, I, I can't say for sure. It's like, oh, you know, you, you probably fall into more the jnana yoga or the bhakti yoga or the karma yoga. And then if you just follow those paths, you'll gain enlightenment because that somehow relates to more of what you do. But not always the case, but sometimes it is. <laughs> uh, I am, again, I am definitely not the person to say, hey, you know what, I fall more into karma yoga and therefore let me follow karma yoga to enlightenment. Clearly it says that everyone is a little bit of everything in terms of the yogas and you tend to lean more towards one over another, but I don't know if that necessarily guarantees enlightenment. Okay. Again, not the person, not the expert in this stuff, just trying to oh, think it out. This is from Daniel, who lives in Philippines. He says, uh, how can I confirm that I know that I am Atma? No witness. And how can I know that I'm not confused or imagining things? It's easy to be confused about things that are far away. If you see on the horizon a little figure, you can't make out what is that, that figure. Or a common expression in, in uh, commentaries on Vedanta texts is in a, in a field, if you see a figure, you're not sure if it's a um, tree stump or a thief. <laughs> and you might become fearful thinking it's a thief when it's only a tree stump. That which is far away from you is subject to uh, misinterpretation. That obviously then that which is closer to you should, it should be easier to ascertain. This is just a principle. That which is remote is hard to know clearly. That which is proximate, that which is near, is easier to know clearly. And here, in Advaita Vedanta, we understand that Atma is not near, Atma is you. There is zero distance between you and Atma, which means there's no distance whatsoever, there's no possibility of misunderstanding. And let, let me make that a little bit more clear. Your true nature is consciousness. You are a, let me, let me try it this way, you are a conscious being. Can anyone argue with that? <laughs> you can't argue with that. Anything else you can argue with, but you can't argue with the statement that you are a conscious being. How did you figure that out? Did you have to study a lot of Advaita Vedanta? <laughs> you studied Bhagavad Gita, you studied the works of Shankara, and now you know, I am a conscious being. You don't need Vedanta to know that. You know it, then how? It is self-evident. In Sanskrit, Swatta Siddha, self-evident. That you are a conscious being, is a self-evident truth. Is it possible to make a mistake 
about a self-evident truth. What would that be? I am not conscious or I don't exist, right? Those would be the two mistakes. If I am a conscious being, the two possible mistakes, actually three. One is I'm not conscious. Two is I don't exist. Three is I'm neither conscious nor existent. <laughs> Just, they have fun with this. <clears throat> so these mistakes can be made. Is it possible to conclude? Is it possible for you to make the mistake of saying, I'm not conscious? Not possible. Can you make the mistake of saying you don't exist? Not possible. That you are a conscious being is a self-evident truth about which it's impossible to have confusion. I was thinking along the lines that maybe you would confuse yourself with your ego as opposed to your true self. Yes, you recognize you're a conscious being, but perhaps you might confuse your conscious being with the ego, which is the biggest part of, uh, uh, well, I believe one of the biggest part of Advaita Vedanta is to confusing yourself with the ego instead of your true nature. But. <laughs> Always a but. But it's possible to have wrong conclusions uh -oh. <laughs> about a self-evident Atma. Let me explain. That you are a conscious being is self-evident. But that you as a conscious being are affected by happiness and sadness in your mind is your conclusion that you are a conscious being subject to suffering due to illness and disease is your conclusion. That you are a conscious being who is born and subject to death is your conclusion. Turns out, not surprisingly, all these conclusions are wrong. Here, here's a very interesting way of describing Vedanta. The role of Vedanta is not to reveal your essential nature as a conscious being. Why? You already know. You don't need Vedanta to know. Self-evident, self-revealing. The role of Vedanta is to remove all your wrong conclusions heaped on top of that self-evident truth. So when you say, I am a conscious being subject to birth, death, suffering, etc., etc., those are your conclusions. They are wrong conclusions. Those conclusions are removed, negated by the teachings of Vedanta. And those are the conclusions that make you suffer. If your only conclusion about yourself is, I am a conscious being, there's no suffering. Suffering, what, what is that? You have to work at suffering. <laughs> you have to get into it, as they, as, they, as they say, which means suffering requires some mental activity. Suffering requires, in Vedantic terms, suffering involves identification with your body and mind and other things. That is a source of suffering. So, your true nature is conscious being, but it turns out what Vedanta, by the way, it's not that Vedanta reveals nothing. What Vedanta does in fact reveal, which you can't know without, without Vedanta you can know that you are a conscious being. But without Vedanta, you can't know that your consciousness is not yours. Without Vedanta, you can't know that what you call your consciousness is actually the fabric of reality, Brahman. And this is what is known through Vedanta. That you are a conscious being, self-evident. That you are, that, that you are, that your consciousness is not yours, but instead consciousness is identical to Brahman. One of the Mahavakyas is Prajnanam Brahma. Brahman is 
consciousness. That discovery is made through the teachings of Vedanta. Okay. Um, All right, I'm going to pause it right here. So, um, I guess, let me know what you think about my explanation of the map. You know, is there any, anything wrong with it? If, if there is, definitely let me know. Um, I will try to read the comments. Um, again, like I say, I don't always get a chance to read the comments. It's been very, very rare that I can. However, whenever I do get an email, I do get a notification. And I do look at the uh, do look at the email comments that I get, and and uh, YouTube doesn't always email me, but whenever I do have time, which is very rare, I will try to go to my comment section. But again, I haven't had a chance to lately because there's been just a lot of stuff since the beginning of the uh, roughly the beginning of the new years. So, anyways, let me know in the comments below. If you like my content, please consider subscribing. Thumbs up, thumbs down, down below. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next vid.